many people here, especially given the time of year. Everyone seems really enthused. I really like the iPads because um, that was really clear. It's really a good way of showing the website and, and having to go of it in a, in a kind of uh, in, in a nice environment. Really, so that was a really good idea. The speakers were excellent, very knowledgeable speakers. Uh, the presentations were very interesting. There was a wide variety of speakers, which was good from all partners within the project, and overall, it was great. Changing and evolving. This seems to have been forever. And those of you involved in the advice world and in the um, not-for-profit sector and the voluntary sector will know this is never ending. You know, the world changes around us, our environment changes, and we have to adapt and change with it. In 2012, um, we got a consultant in to review the structure and purpose of Liverpool Specialist Advice Services. And obviously, in a changing world and knowing that the end of the LSE Legal Services Commission contract was coming. During that period, we also went through and revised a vision and a mission statement for Liverpool Specialist Advice Services as it is and as it is moving forward. And the vision is for quality and appropriate advice services to be freely and widely available to everyone living and working in Liverpool and across the city region. And the mission statement is that Liverpool Specialist Advice Services is an umbrella organisation whose mission is to support and enable CABs and other partner organisations to provide accessible, quality and appropriate general, specialist and legal advice across Liverpool and the region. So with those in mind, we were starting to look towards what we needed to do to make changes to then start to live um, the vision and the mission statements. During this period, we also undertook a set of social accounts. Some of you may know about social accounts, um, but this is like an audit, if you like, a, a social and economic audit of your organisation. And we uh, were the first Citizens Advice Bureau in the country to get external verification of what we do. And those social accounts have been published um, and involved all of the CABs um, in Liverpool, as well as Liverpool Specialist Advice Services. <laughs> Looking to the future, we're focusing more on raising awareness and social policy and campaigning work, as well as continuing to manage and coordinate projects. We held successful, successful Impact Day, and some of you may have that uh, brochure in your packs, in December 2012, and that was focusing on welfare reform and highlighting the impact of clients um, and services on the changes that are happening nationally. The name, Liverpool's Specialist Device Services, reflects the past and not the future. And we, we wanted a new name that started to take us forward into the future that we want to become. We know that a lot of people know about Citizens Advice Bureau, but there are also lots of misconceptions. If you ask most people out in the street about CAB and they'll say, oh yes, that, that's the government agency or the local authority run that, don't, they don't realise that we're a charity that the Bureau um, you know, have to be constantly looking to raise money for the services that they provide. And you know, that takes a lot of time and energy as well uh, as providing the direct services. CAB is a household name, and yet we still need to, to do more to make people realize what it is that we actually do. Liverpool still has some of the most deprived areas in the country. It's got high unemployment. We're in the top 20% low proportion of working age population in employment, we're in the bottom 20%. High long-term unemployment, we're in the top 20%. Low in terms of skills and qualifications, we're in the bottom 20%. High on index of multiple deprivation, which is around health, crime, income, education. And again, we're in the 20% of the most deprived districts. And that's despite uh, Liverpool having um, quite a successful um, buoyancy, if you like. I mean, I've been around Liverpool a long time, and, uh, you know, Liverpool One has made a huge difference to the way people feel about Liverpool and the, and the centre, but it hasn't made that difference to people out there in the areas. In 2012-13, CABs in Liverpool dealt with over 22,500 clients, of which 48% of those were disabled. They dealt with 66,500 problems from those clients. 
The main problem areas were benefits, so 50% of our inquiries were benefits, 32% debt, housing is 4%, and employment is 2%. We know that there's increasing demand and there is going to be less resources. And in fact, it is the perfect storm. I'd like at this point to thank all our funders for those who give us and the Citizens Advice Bureau uh, individually um, funding to help us continue our services to clients. And particularly to thank Liverpool City Council for their continued support to the advice sector, despite su substantial cuts to public services. So Liverpool citizens, these are the people we want to provide our services to. We know we don't reach a lot of them. You know, people may know about the CAB service, but, you know, we know ourselves. If you ask people, you know, can they get through to us? They'll say, oh, it's still difficult to get through by telephone. Uh, I don't know where they are. I don't know what their opening hours are. Um, so we need to do more to let people know what it is that we do and how they can get to us and to provide services in the most accessible way into the communities. We need to make the most of available resources to help where it's most needed. And we need to change the way we do things. The website that we're showcasing today is the kind of first port of call for people to be able to access the CABs and advice services. So one place where they can go and find out where the opening hours are, um, where they can contact their local CAB, um, what the telephone number is, how they can get through. And it's all under one umbrella of a website. Um, I've been wanting this to happen for a long time and I'm really pleased um, to be here today at the launch of that. Um, it, it's still being structured, it's still you know, a lot of work to be done on it, but the, the basic framework is there. And I think that will help us all um, come together under the one service umbrella. Telephones, we need to do more to make it easier for people to, to, to get through to us. And the other one is digital by default. This is the changing world. We know that the, the way the government are structuring and the changes in legislation, people are going to have to get to grips with the digital world. I'm of the generation. My sons can do it a lot better than I can. Um, you know, and I, I can kind of get there eventually with a lot of support and help. Um, but there's a lot of people for whom this is just, you know, really, really going to get in the way of them um, getting the help they need. And we need to find ways of um, making that easier for them. Focusing face-to-face -face resources where it's needed most. And more out and ways of delivering, different ways of delivering services. We've got the improving financial confidence and money management uh, funding, and you'll hear more about that later. We've also got two years uh, from the big transition fund, which is a multi-agency partnership to help people with employment and welfare benefits tribunals and support volunteering and digital inclusion. Um, and recently we've heard we've got a grant of 150,000 for the next three years in partnership with Sefton for welfare benefits advice. So all of this will help. Citizens Advice was established in the wartime. In fact, it was 1939. And Liverpool Central CAB was one of the first in the country um, to be established, along with, I think in this area, Birkenhead and Bootle. And that means that it's 75th anniversary in 2014. So we need to be looking at ways in which we can celebrate that. Um, and to use that as an opportunity, if you like, um, to, to promote our services. The Citizens Advice nationally is changing too, looking at digital inclusion, phone service, and very much more around um, CABs individually working in partnership with each other as well as other agencies. We've also received money from the Citizens Advice Transformation Fund to help us in our journey of change. And our thanks to them too. Hawkins. Um, I've worked for the Big Lottery Fund for the last eight years on various different programmes, my place, some international projects, and I've been working on the Improving Financial Confidence programme for the last 12 months. 
Um, I manage uh, with Alsace the grant from the big lottery fund side of things <coughs> along with the, the raise grant, some people here from them today. So uh, really just to tell you a little bit about the program and the ideas behind the pot of funding and set you on course to thinking what it is that we're trying to achieve. So improving financial confidence is actually one of our strategic initiatives. Um, and when we say that, what we mean is that they are sizable grants. Um, in actual fact, in the end, we had £30 million on offer for the IFC programme, and the committee was so impressed with the portfolio as a whole that they actually awarded slightly over that. The fundamental basic of the programme is to enable social housing tenants to become more financially capable. So it's not just about accessing services, although that is part of the activity, it's actually about the confidence that you have to actually use those services. So yes, you may open an appropriate bank account, but actually what do you do with that bank account? How do you use it? Uh, we also uh, wanted full engagement and support from uh, their landlords, so housing associations, and as you'll see, uh, we asked for a cross-sector partnership to reflect that. Okay, so we set about four main outcomes for, for the programme, but you'll see they have two very specific goals. Uh, primarily, as I was saying, it's about social housing tenants getting greater access and affordable and to appropriate and affordable financial services. We recognise that at the time uh, people take out their tenancy agreements that they really are at the peak of being vulnerable. That's the point when they are potentially about to get into debt, about to get into difficulty. And we really wanted to try and do something to address that journey that looked at prevention um, before they got into that relationship. We also, as well as looking at services and projects and improved confidence to use them, we also wanted a wider agenda for the program um, and we really wanted through the data that we collate from all of our projects to be able to at the end of the the project's lives to be able to present real cold hard facts of if you put money into preventing debt rather than traditional debt advice uh, that it can give you a real improvement a real achievement so we had a fourth outcome for ourselves that was specifically around collecting data uh, and enabling that to happen. So um, we had quite a specific remit for our projects that we're looking to apply. So um, as I mentioned before, we wanted a cross-sector partnership. Um, we wanted them to be led by a voluntary or community sector organisation. The key thing was really that projects must be preventative. So there's definitely a place for projects that look at that traditional debt advice, uh, but we wanted to do something different, really champion um, a different type of activity that was going to work with people in a different type of way. Um, as such, then, we wanted projects to be innovative. Um, you know, they would obviously build on some of their successes of the past for the experience of the organisations that were applying, but we didn't want it to be a continuation fund in any way. Um, and in line with our People Power Change initiative, we really want the people that are going to benefit from this service to be involved in every way that they possibly can. So some of our projects have um, peer mentors that are actually volunteers that have come through the service already as a beneficiary. Uh, we want people to be involved in the design and have a say about activities um, and say what works for them, what they like and what they would champion. Um, improving financial confidence is actually a test and learn program for BIG and what that means is we're looking for those really frank, honest conversations along the way to say what is and isn't working during the life of the grant so that we can genuinely do something about that, try and adjust, try and make changes, um, all for this bigger agenda at the end of proving that debt prevention has its place. Okay, so as I say, we awarded slightly over what we anticipated, and what that meant was that we were able to fund 37 projects in total, um, at least one in each uh, region, obviously two in this region. Um, ranges from eight in London, and then we've got one 
in the southeast, which is shelter. Um, we had a real mix of applications, which I think has really given us some uh, key information so far for the programme. So grants are led by different types of organisation and therefore come at activity from a slightly different aspect. We've got applications that are led by citizens advice bureaus, housing associations, and then some others by community sector organisations. Okay, now this initial split of how the projects looked at first um, is slightly changing as we, as we move on and we test our test and learn approach. So initially we had a split of projects that, whose target beneficiaries were first time tenants, um, in and out of work, uh, young people aged 16 to 24. What we're now finding is some of the other projects are progressing that as the demand comes in is that some of our groups are finding that actually the demand is slightly different to how they first thought. So we're finding that some of the groups that may have applied just under the one target beneficiary type are actually expanding and delivering to more. Some are becoming more focused. And as I say, that really is trying to, us trying to make uh, projects appropriate to those local areas. Uh, grant sizes ranged from half a million to a million pounds, and as is always the case, if a million pounds is on offer, most people will want <laughs> near enough the million pounds, but that's, that's fine, that's what it's there for. So, um, as I mentioned before, our fourth outcome is around collecting data so that we can argue a case uh, one way or another at the end of the programme, and as such, I manage the Acorus contract uh, that we have, a big lottery fund. They are specifically responsible for collating that data for us. So that will be right from the frontline service of a frontline worker sitting down with beneficiary, going through a questionnaire, um, and then going through another questionnaire with them six months later to see how their confidence has grown. That data goes back into the Acorus database and we use that. Uh, we distributed it through newsletters. Uh, they have a website and a portal and I would encourage you to sort of uh, link with each other through the portal and see what's happening with the other projects. And finally, I think we really wanted um, projects to respect their local areas, so uh, for events to really involve their local press, uh, publicity, champion social media as much as possible. Some projects are looking at apps that kind of thing, webinars. Um, merchandise, obviously you want a brand that um, people recognise that that is for this project and really to drum up local support so that the project is sustainable socially um, by the end of the grant. Um, that's also something that we can help with at BIG and you know try to do that wherever possible. Really, that's um, everything from me to say. Um, very pleased to be here at this launch. It's a very exciting time. I think a lot of hard work has gone into getting the project where it is now, and it's exciting to be at this point where we can get things going and get activity out there to people. Thank you. The main questions that is posed to me is what is IFC um, and as Jane has already explained it's a project delivered across England to support those in their financial capability. Big National Lottery actually has a definition for financial capability um, and this is the confidence and skills needed to choose, access and use financial products and services suitable to an individual's needs. And LCAP, Liverpool Citizens Advice Partnership, have been awarded funding to deliver this project, focusing on, focusing on supporting vulnerable first-time tenants in partnership across Liverpool. Um, one of the major criticisms um, of financial advice is that it's provided too late in the stage. So, for example, a client is already overwhelmed or is already consumed with debt or in trouble. Advice agencies, registered social landlords report that the large amount of first-time tenants become overwhelmed from their first utility bill, rent payments, other bills, etc., within the first three months of the tenancy. And financial capability is, as Jane said, a preventative measure. That's the whole point of this project. 
And it's essential that first-time vulnerable tenants are actually identified as soon as possible to ensure they have access to the correct support, advice and information. So our aim with this project delivery is to support social landlords and social tenants to ensure that they have greater access to the financial capability advice, sessions, services, etc. To actually increase the skills and the confidence to use financial products and services um, and to support volunteers who will be delivering these advice sessions so they can actually sustain the delivery, um, work within the community, be you know, a, a key focal point and actually advise others on, you know, on a similar level. The main aim of the project is to deliver financial capability advice to vulnerable first-time tenants through cross-sector partnership. And that's the main thing that stands out for myself, as Jane mentioned before, that's a really key word. Um, LCAP have developed a project group and we have over 12 partners involved, plus support from active advice agencies, educational establishments and volunteering councils. We have five main work streams that are delivering this project. We have South Liverpool CAB with volunteer recruitment, so the volunteer advisor recruitment process. North Liverpool CAB focusing on volunteer training, including the essential training, so working with vulnerable adults, um, working with those who've suffered through maybe domestic abuse or who need additional um, support through support needs. So it's creating that awareness and making sure we're supporting the volunteers as well, not just the first time tenants. Uh, we have Merseyside Welfare Rights, focusing on quality and assurance and reporting, so they work alongside LCAP to deliver on that. And Wavertree and Netherly um, CAB with the IT and the web development, so the portals, the websites, etc., the referral process, actually, that will be online, hopefully, end of January. Um, and then not forgetting, actually, the other partners involved in the project, which are integral, the support partners and advice agencies that are facilitating us and, and helping us with the delivery. You know, there's a list as long as my arm, and I do apologise if I've messed, missed anyone out, but I do want to mention you because you've all been very, very helpful, and especially to myself when I've come on board with this project. We have Nugent Care, Croxeth and Gilmoss Community Federation. We have RAISE as well, we're working in conjunction with, and obviously delivering a similar project, but they've been extremely supportive. We have Speak CAB, Central CAB, and obviously the registered social landlords as well and other advice agencies. So I, I do feel that you know, there's a mention there. Across the five-year period for the IFC project, uh, Liverpool Citizens Advice Partnership and all involved, the aims are to recruit and train and place 216 volunteer advisors. This is only achievable with the continued participation and support of the project partners, as I've mentioned so far. Um, we also aim to support 2,156 first-time tenants to manage their confidence in dealing with the finances and support them in developing their financial knowledge and confidence. So far, <laughs> we have been able to achieve and actually complete a pilot programme to ensure that the first referrals of beneficiaries um, are accepted by January 2014. We have been able to receive feedback from partners involved, um, work streams and volunteers. We have been able to develop and adapt training, um, tweak courses, undertake evaluation, and just basically listen to the project as a whole. The main thing as well is to actually communicate and involve registered social landlords and other advice agencies, educational establishments. It's to ensure that year two delivery, which will be March next year, moving forward, um, can actually progress and develop dramatically now you know, in the quality, the service delivery, and actually the coverage area of this project within the Liverpool area. It's to be able to meet the demand for the service that we know is out there, as Jane has mentioned. Part of my role as the development officer in looking after this project is to communicate and, and speak to others. And as Jane again pointed out before, to actually involve feedback and speak to those who are involved directly on the front line. interesting someone was talking about branding um, earlier um, it's quite important for organizations and um, we've had people put together the PowerPoint presentation sort of format um, and I would have loved to have been there at the conversation that, that said uh, what, what is it that really um, makes you feel right about revitalizing neighborhoods and being a social landlord and transforming lives and someone saying well it's someone throwing a kite it must be that's the so um, so I'm Michael Phillips, I'm the volunteering manager um, at Riverside. 
Um, and I'm going to talk to you about sort of one particular thing uh, this morning, which is this, um, and it's not about being an on-off button. Um, it's about power. Uh, I think it's really interesting, really interesting that um, we're used to talking about power when we, when we think about politics. And we're used to talking about power um, when we talk about business. So people talk about Alan Sugar being a very powerful man and various politicians being incredibly powerful. It's not a word that's very much used when we talk about charities and the third sector and housing organisations. And I'd just like to redress the balance slightly um, today because I think this is a project that has immense power in a, in a variety of different ways. I'm going to take you through those. Um, first of all, it's powerful for um, housing organisations. Um, I think it's very interesting. I did some Google searching on images um, the image on the, the left of the screen is uh, social housing in Slovenia um, and the, the other one is obviously a red brick terrace in, in Kensington or it could be Waverstreet, various different places. Um, and maybe one day, if things get really powerful, we can start having social housing that looks like that in Slovenia. Um, but it's very powerful um, for, our, for our business and people forget that housing organisations still have to be a business. Of course, we're trying to engage with very many vulnerable people, but our business still needs to run. And housing organisations are a situation now that they've never been in before. Um, someone mentioned a perfect storm um, for advice agencies, uh, Alison did, and it's very much a perfect storm for housing organisations too. Um, the bedroom tax has had a pretty profound impact on housing organisations. Now, I don't actually think we've seen the worst of it yet. I think we've got to get across Christmas where people have had to make some really difficult choices in the run-up to Christmas, um, and we'll only see the real impact on our arrears and, uh, and on our tenants after Christmas. Um, so it's powerful for us in that we know that we might have a tool here that can help people sustain their tenancy. Um, one void for um, a housing organisation will probably cost them £4,000 just to turn that around, just to clear it out. Um, and then there's the lost income uh, when you haven't got someone in that, uh, in that home and Riverside's a pretty big organisation. We've got over 50,000 homes. We're talking millions of pounds that we could lose through the bedroom tax. So this is a really potentially powerful tool for us as an organisation to support people in their tenancies. There's also a big thing, certainly in our organisation, I think possibly in other housing organisations around value for money. Where are we going to put on? We've got some money to do community engagement, community regeneration type activities, but where do we put it? Um, now, at the moment, we're spending a lot of time, and this is in the leaflet, we spend a lot of time looking at our tenants who've got arrears and trying to help them through that. Being able to, to engage with something which is essentially free to us, we can engage it in a variety of different ways, but it's essentially free to us is a brilliant value for money tool. So it's powerful in that way. Um, it's also, there's a great power in volunteering itself. Um, I, use the, I, I love this image. I use it in... Um, in volunteer management training that I do sometimes to kind of give a, a pictorial representation of how some organisations engage with volunteers, feel about volunteers, and that they're actually on the outside looking in. But there's some people sort of floating around on the outside, but there's an awful lot of people who want to really make something happen, really make something work. What's good about this project, I think, is that volunteers are very much embedded at the heart. It wouldn't work without volunteers. That's what this project is about. And there's a huge power in that. Um, I think it was mentioned, and it was in the video there, about the, the, just the power of volunteering itself for the volunteers. Now, there's huge amounts of compelling evidence. I'm not going to go through all of it at all um, about how it can help people in terms of their mental health, their overall well-being, um, just their general outlook, um, their life chances, their uh, employment uh, chances as well. But um, not many people know, um, and there's a little bit of research around that. Apparently, volunteers have a better sex life. Um, now, I'm not sure we're going to do any evaluation on that for big, but it's just something to bear in mind to tell volunteers when we're doing some recruitment. Um, but there's a huge, a huge power in volunteering. There's also a little bit of research, and I'd love to see more on this, about whether people prefer to receive a service from a volunteer or a paid member of staff. Now, there's some interesting research that actually says people prefer it from a volunteer because the volunteer wants to be there, a member of staff has to be there. Now, for some people, they talk about a drop potentially in quality when you have a volunteer delivering something. Um, and I say in my organisation that volunteers can do anything. Um, now, 
we'd never actually had that exchange before he left as our group, um, group chair, but Paul Brandt um, said something while the whole kind of big society thing was floating around, and I'm sure people have got their own kind of opinions on, on the big society and what it meant. But Paul said in an interview that um, there are some things you would want a volunteer to do, and there's some things you wouldn't. Now, you, and, and his example was that you might not want a volunteer to check chlorine levels in a swimming pool. Now, it depends on the volunteer. Now, I've been swimming on Sunday mornings, and I'm not particularly, I don't have great faith, actually, a lot of the time in those young men and women who've probably been out the night before who are supposed to be looking after my safety. Now, they're the ones checking chlorine levels. We're saying 21, 22-year-olds, probably from university, um, who are a little bit hungover, checking chlorine levels. Do you trust that individual, or do you trust an ex-chemical engineer who believes in council-provided leisure services, who thinks it's in something they could do? I'm, I'm going with the ex-chemical engineer. I'm not going with the, the, the hungover students. I really believe the power that volunteers can do anything, and the quality of what they deliver can also be really high as well. It's also incredibly pow powerful for the people that we're going to be um, engaging with. Um, there's no other avenue I can see where they might get this kind of thing from. You know, the, the local council cuts are, well, they haven't even finished, have they? There's so much more to come. Um, so the local council isn't going to be able to provide these. The central government doesn't have any kind of nuanced understanding of the impact of its welfare reforms on some individuals. The, bedroom, the way the bedroom tax has been rolled out has shown that, um, and the way that universal credit is sort of limping on has also sort of shown that. Um, so where, where do tenants, where, where can they go? And it's, it's incredible how one little bit of advice can make a difference. Um, Riverside has a whole load of houses around Peel Road in Bootle, and my colleague was a housing officer there, and he was saying that some people there were going to doorstep money lenders. And there was a credit union, literally 400 yards up the road, but they didn't know what it was for, they didn't, didn't know what it does. Now, that could be the credit union's fault, but if we can have volunteers at least signposting people to go to a credit union to access credit, instead of going to, door, instead of going to doorstep lenders, again, there's a huge power in that. It's something very simple, but something that can make a massive difference. Um, I also think there's power in partnerships. Now, partnership working has been around for you know, many, many years. And um, in a previous life, I worked for Bernardo's, and we actually ran a conference on partnership working and did various partnership things. Um, and when they didn't work, we always called it a, uh, a learning opportunity, which basically meant that it didn't go so well, but it was a learning opportunity. Um, but partnerships at their very best are an incredibly um, effective way of working. Um, and I think here, it's going to be really good for RSLs in particular. I think we're a very insular um, kind of uh, a group, group of organisations. Um, there'll be benchmarking between housing organisations. I'm not sure how often they're very good at looking outside of what they do. Um, and being able to work with advice agencies and seeing their take on how they do certain things will be really powerful for RSLs. Um, however, you know, partnerships, just that ability to talk in a room with people who've got a range of different backgrounds and to define the problem because of those range of backgrounds in a much more nuanced way, and also then to select your solution to solve that problem because of the experience and the difference experience in that room is incredibly powerful as well. So I, I won't quite get the last word because now Alison's uh, going to um, finish up. But I've, you know, I, I talked about power sort of very, very briefly, but at the moment um, it's not quite there, is it? This is only potential. Um, we're only really kicking off, we're about to go into year two. So I, I think most people here have some kind of stake um, in this project, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So it's not just me, um, it's not just LCAP, it's everyone in this room that we all have the, the, the ability to make this something um, incredibly powerful. Thank you. Um, I think I'm really happy with the event and I think um, everyone involved with it will be because it was a fantastic turnout um, and I think there was also a really nice sense of what the project is about and people getting a really strong sense about improving financial confidence so the view from um, Big Lottery was really important to give us um, a really good idea of how wide this project is, that we're not just on our own, we're part of a much wider um, group of people who are all working on the same kind of thing. Um, it was incredibly interesting to hear about the background of the Citizens Advice Bureau and 
um, its long history and uh, some of the challenges it's got right now. Um, and also, I was really glad to be able to sort of pull things together to talk about how um, social landlords can be involved in the project and the benefit to social landlords, but also um, about how important volunteering is to the project and the power of volunteering and volunteers to change people's lives. Um, I would hope that the, the emphasis that um, was placed on the fact that this is something that is value for money, that there's no charge for it, that can help sustain tenancies, that can help um, vulnerable tenants as they, as they start in their tenancy, would be a pretty strong draw for RSLs, and especially knowing the, the funding background and, the, the, um, and also the expertise of the citizens of ICPRs involved should make it a really strong offer. The, the idea of the whole project, with some really, really toughs coming in in terms of austerity measures um, and also um, bedroom tax, universal credit and other things, I think projects of this nature, financial confidence, are absolutely key in terms of supporting the citizens of Liverpool. Um, I think anybody who's doing any kind of work with the citizens of Liverpool um, will find a benefit to this actual project in terms of the support that people need, without a doubt. My name is Joe Lavelle. I work for North Liverpool Citizens Advice Bureau, and um, I really enjoyed today. It was uh, it was uh, very informative. I left. Uh, I'm about to leave, knowing much more than I did at the beginning. Um, it was it was well organised, great venue, um, uh, great speakers. Uh, I really liked the iPads because um, that was really clear. It's really a uh, good way of showing the website and, and having a go of it in a, in a kind of uh, in, in a nice environment. Really, so that was a really good idea. OK, well, I'm Paul Radford. I am a member of the um, Wavertree Citizens Advice Bureau Board and I'm also a member of the Legal Services, or as it's going to be, LCAP Board. So I don't provide any day-to-day -day services. I'm more involved with more strategic um, management and development. So I was interested to come here today to find out what the project was about and I think really from the start, from the initial greeting downstairs by the building management and then up here, um, the people who were managing the event, uh, the catering, and it was a surprise, I think, to come up here and find that we were uh, high enough to get the benefit of the view across the dock and across the river. Um, the equipment that was here that showed the uh, project website as it's developing that was interesting and I think of all the speeches the uh, the general quality was very very high explain to you what the project was about who was involved who had financed it what they were hoping to achieve what they'd already achieved um, and so I think all of that gave you uh, a very very good insight into what the project was about so much so I think that when, as it will be reported back to the various boards I'm involved in, at least I'll be confident that I know what's being talked about and we can pass on then as appropriate encouragement and congratulations to the people involved. So I'm Jane Hawkins, funding officer from the Big Lottery Fund. Um, absolutely fabulous event, really amazing building to come into. Um, fantastic to see so many people here, especially given the time of year. Everyone seems really enthused. Interesting to walk around and look at um, the volunteering video. I thought that was fab. Um, overall, a really smooth event. I enjoyed very much the partnership presentation. So exciting times. Thank you. I very much enjoyed today's event. Uh, from the moment we came in, uh, the event was entirely well organised. I mean, it was exactly where to go. The meeting and greeting, the organisation of the badges, the hanging of the coats, that kind of thing, was all extremely well organised. Nothing worse than coming into a place not knowing what to do, but today was great. It was great to actually see the website up and running. We've heard so much about the development of it. It was great to actually have a look at it and have a play around with it. And I'm looking forward to seeing the finished product. The speakers were excellent, very knowledgeable speakers. Uh, the presentations were very interesting. There was a wide variety of speakers, which was good, from all partners within the project. And overall, it was great. But I think it's the right time to become involved in financial capability and improving financial confidence. Uh, we, are a we are a host organisation, Liverpool Central. We'll be hosting volunteers as part of the project. But if we weren't doing that, I would be keen to become involved. Yeah.